Uh, good evening, welcome to the first evening lecture uh, of our spring series. Uh, as an early warning, next week, week from today, Monday, is Marlon Blackwell, architect and chair of uh, architecture at the University of Arkansas. Uh, tonight, it gives me great pleasure to be able to welcome Michael Maltzen to UIC and Chicago, uh, especially on the heels of his being named uh, in the January uh, metropolis of one of the 12 game changers field of design for 2012, uh, and also having just uh, announced uh, on Friday uh, that he was the winner, uh, Michael Maltzen's firm, the winner of the St. Petersburg uh, Peer Competition. Um, so we're glad that he could be here after all these recent uh, events. Receiving his BR from RISD and his MR from Harvard, Michael worked as a project designer at Frank Gehry and Associates before forming Michael Maltzen Architecture in 1995. A child of Levittown uh, and a citizen of Los Angeles, Michael's practice has been motivated, among other things, by a quest to produce the effects of urbanism with seemingly compromised initial materials, i.e. the single-family house and sprawl. And he's repeatedly pulled off that unlikely combination, uh, as evidenced, among other work, with the Inner City Arts Campus, uh, a project that spans his private practice career, almost, uh, and they received the Rudy Bruner Foundation's gold medal for urban excellence. Uh, in the current issue of Metropolis, um, and I think probably against the biases of its editors, uh, for which I am internally pleased, uh, Michael has refreshingly dismissed the idea of a gap between socially engaged and architecturally experimental work, and introduces the concept of elasticity in both cultural and architectural terms to suggest that the two agendas can come together in the work of the office. I like to think that Michael's uh, idea of the elastic has a strong resonance uh, with our use of the term plastic in the school's agenda of advancing a simultaneously formal and political discipline. Uh, Michael's projects, whose clients range from Hollywood moguls to the homeless of Skid Row, demonstrate that what is determinative at the end uh, is not budget or client, but architectural strategy. And it's Michael's relentless investigation of specific architectural issues that draws comparisons, for example, between a private house, like the Pittman Dow residence, uh, to housing projects such as the Carver Apartments, due to the re reappearance of self-similar diagrams across <coughs> disparate projects. Regardless of scale or context, the overall body of work is a kind of clinic on contemporary variations on long-standing architectural issues, how a building hits the ground, question of aperture and opening for movement and view, the orchestration of public and private activities, how to turn a corner, and the engendering of memorable profiles. Michael's first uh, work first started to haunt my dreams, I guess, um, when I saw his solo exhibition at the GSD, probably almost 10 years ago now, uh, which among other projects highlighted uh, early versions of his Fresno Museum. Uh, and a great, in my recollection, I don't remember the name of the project, but I recall it as a, of course I would, uh, as a martini-shaped house uh, in Malibu, in plan martini shape. Um, and so I realized at that moment that Michael was a fellow traveler of shape, and so I have a special esteem, uh, hold his work as part of my secret canon. Um, as a long-standing critic of the hexagon, all of you know that I hate honeycombs and more noise. Uh, I was immediately persuaded and relieved by Michael's single-handed invention of the Septagon, uh, the seven-sided figure evolving from Fresno to the more recent Pittman Dow House. The beauty of the work is that unlike work that manufactures the feeling of difficulty, Michael's work distills complexities of the world to images and organizations that are clear as they can be without being reductive. In today's American context, the recent depth and breadth of Michael's work across public and civic institutional types uh, to a uh, number of experiments with housing and specifically how architecture contributes to larger urban issues, uh, I think is unprecedented for its consistent inventiveness. Probably due to the sway of a couple of recent uh, exhibitions, I'm tempted to introduce him as contemporary LA's version of Bertrand Goldberg. Uh, but I'll resist that parochialism uh, and ask you simply to help uh, join me in welcoming Michael Walson. <laughs> 
influenced by, uh, by the city. Uh, uh, and especially uh, the role of architecture as it relates to um, uh, thinking in contemporary way uh, about urban, uh, urban spaces, urban places, urban questions, uh, urban problems. But I want to start with a house tonight. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think uh, in, in uh, working a place like Los Angeles, having come from a place like that, uh, and also uh, probably in my background, uh, the house as a unit of the contemporary city, I think, is, is uh, still a very, very interesting uh, and uh, challenging uh, question for architecture, architecture today. Uh, I also think uh, that the uh, idea of the house has, in many ways, uh, over the course of, of the history of architecture, been a unit of experimentation for uh, issues that you could uh, potentially say uh, were urban issues. Uh, ideas of, of social interaction, uh, uh, relationships between uh, disparate uh, functional and programmatic types, uh, condensation of, um, of often uh, politics within in one unit. All of those, those questions are very much uh, contained in the house and also simultaneously uh, contained in the city. And in that way, I think you, 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 can, you can say still uh, that the house is or can be seen as a microcosm of the city. We, uh, uh, a number of years uh, now, uh, it's been uh, th probably three years, uh, we built a house for two painters, Larry Pittman and Roy Dow, in the hills up above the valley of Los Angeles. And um, that valley uh, is very much the quintessential valley um, that, uh, that you know of as, as Los Angeles kind of sprawl suburb that moved out from uh, the original centers of, of the city in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And it's really right on the edge, on the threshold of uh, uh, nature, the uh, San, or San Gabriel Mountains, and that, uh, that quintessential landscape of, of Los Angeles. The house uh, was, or is, built on a, a flat site adjacent to uh, a house that the owners originally bought and occupied and have occupied for around 10 years, which is a Neutra house, the Saronic house from the 1950s, that Neutra built for his, um, his assistant at the time and her, uh, her husband. They bought about 10 acres of land, which is this entire piece. Uh, and when Neutra uh, built the house, he also convinced the Saronics to cut a series of additional flat pads, building pads, onto the site. Um, it's, a, it's questionable whether he thought that eventually they were just going to run out of money and they needed to subdivide the property and build other, other pieces. Although around the same time, Neutra, like a lot of modernists, were experimenting with the idea of multiple houses on one site, compounds uh, on one site, starting to develop a, a, an idea of, of the multiple, the iterative uh, in these houses um, uh, and start uh, trying to create uh, not so much a compound, but maybe again also microcosms of a larger idea of, of uh, 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 the house as, as a unit of, of, of larger urbanism. Um, you come up to the house and you spiral up to it, uh, for the most part in a clockwise fashion. Uh, the original driveway up to the Saronic house was here. That the uh, Saronic house is being maintained as a, as a guest house and a library. And the thing is, it's, it's higher than, than the, the, the new house. So the Neutra house is always looking down at that house. So Neutra had ultimate, the ultimate eternal relationship to, uh, to our house. There's another flat pad, which is more down in the canyon, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, that spiraling up uh, uh, and the movement up and around the house in a, eventually a clockwise uh, fashion had very much to do with uh, the idea of the form, the seven-sided form. Here you see you starting to arrive at the house. The house feels a little bit like it's uh, spinning or starting to fly off uh, this rock which the house is founded on. When you arrive for the most part at the top of the house, uh, it, it isn't quite the lush landscape or at least the more natural landscape that you expect from the mountains, um, uh, but is is really uh, a more um, uh, aesthetic, uh, rock-like, um, abstract landscape at the top. 
then eventually into the, into the carport. Here you can see the carport, and then uh, to the house. The Neutra house is uh, up above. And I want to point out, because it, it it'll have, has an effect on what I talk about later, uh, this stone pine, which while the uh, Neutra house uh, is from that period a quintessential Neutra modernist house, uh, I'd say that the stone pine, just given its scale, is in many ways the more iconic moment uh, in this whole part of, of, uh, of the hillside. Eventually, uh, I mentioned you arrive. The house from the exterior is quite um, opaque. Uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily let on very much either what the interior is like, the interior space is like, the contents are like, or where maybe uh, you even enter, although there's the beginning of an indication uh, uh, here where you see the, the mirrored door that leads you uh, into, into the house. The seven-sided figure uh, was an important, it was interesting one. We looked at, when, when I started working on the house, I was interested in potentially, given the sense of movement around it, that the house would be a round house. Uh, uh, but uh, for a lot of reasons, that actually started to seem like a very static form to me. That as you moved around it, in a sense, it didn't unfold, it stayed the same. And as we started to explore other even-sided figures, uh, six-sided uh, shapes, eight-sided shapes, even ten-sided shapes, what I realized was that each one of them perceptually implied its own symmetry uh, uh, across the figure. You, you could uh, feel the sense of symmetry and parallelism between each of those even-sided figures as you moved up. In a, in a sense, they were just as static a form as the round shape. The thing that was interesting about the odd-shaped form, or odd-numbered forms, uh, the seven-sided figure, was that in your mind, uh, perceptually, you could never quite complete the house. It seemed like uh, the answer was always around the corner, uh, and that, that uh, reinforced uh, the quality that I was after of, of continuing your sense of, of movement and procession uh, to the inside of the house. This is the view from the Neutra house, where the form of the house, the plan of the house, comes through to the roof uh, because uh, given the relationship between Neutra and, uh, uh, and the new house, the roof scape is as much the facade, in fact, is the facade in the classical sense in that it, it, it quite literally uh, allows you to read what, the, what is happening inside of the space. Of, it communicates the intention of the house on that, that, that which kind of becomes the most, uh, in many ways, characteristic part of the house. I mentioned um, uh, the, the Neutra house, which you see here, as being one of those quintessentially modernist houses. Um, this is the uh, other building pad, which uh, the owners have turned into a very beautiful succulent garden. And our house was meant to be the third piece of that. I saw uh, our house being very much in relationship to these, these other two, um, uh, other two uh, highly formed landscapes. The thing about the, no the Neutra house uh, and uh, in relationship to the new house was that if you look at um, uh, the, the, the Neutra house from that period, uh, what makes it so quintessential is its, it's uh, intense and almost romantic belief in, in transparency. The idea that the virtue of that house was to uh, make indistinct the exterior walls of the house, to uh, 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 create a more blurred relationship between inside and outside. And as um, we were working on the house, uh, one of the things that the owners uh, uh, had said from the beginning was that that level of transparency uh, had become overwhelming in a sense, in terms of the way that they were living, just from a climatic standpoint. Uh, the, that first image that I showed uh, hovering above that landscape makes the mountains seem quite bucolic, but in fact, they're anything but. They're, uh, it's a very intense uh, and uh, relentless landscape. It's very cold in the winter. It's very windy at times of the year. Uh, they have a small dog, and there are a lot of coyotes and, and snakes and things that want to eat the small dog that are constantly prowling around the, the landscape. Uh, and at times, the hillside quite literally erupts in fire. This was uh, uh, a really catastrophic, uh, catastrophic fire about three years ago, uh, in which about a month and a half before we finished the house, the flames were coming up just the other side of the hillside. 
unfortunately was stopped at the very, uh, very last moment. But it wasn't just uh, the intensity of the environment uh, that I started to feel like was, uh, was so much at stake in terms of uh, trying to uh, look beyond the modernist uh, model of transparency. It was a question of contemporary culture. Um, one uh, in which, in conversations with Larry and Roy, I started to realize uh, was, was just as much a question of the way in which we live. And what I mean by that is that um, I, I think uh, uh, if our position at this point in culture is one of, of great connectivity, and there's um, lots of reasons for that. Obviously, what's happened uh, uh, to all of us digitally, our ability to uh, quite uh, uh, consistently, on a 24-hour basis, uh, be uh, absolutely connected to all the, many, many different things, the amount of information, uh, that both comes to us and the amount of information about us that is, is uh, constantly flowing out into the world uh, creates a very different world than the modernists live in. It creates one in which our lives uh, are quite literally transparent on a full-time basis, uh, in which our lives are uh, being lived simultaneously, uh, I think you could argue, with the world around them. Uh, and that is a very um, interesting new spatial problem. To me, that idea of simultaneity is maybe the new contemporary spatial problem. And in this house, I was trying to figure out how you could begin to at least, if not explore that, and start to turn that into a quality. And I was interested in, around the same time, uh, a series of, of geometric uh, puzzles, uh, forms that mathematicians uh, work with called mathematical dissections. The reason I was interested in it was not so much for their geometries, but almost more metaphorically what they stood for. And those puzzles are puzzles where uh, mathematicians take an even-sided figure, platonic form like a square, and start to dissect it in a way in which you turn it inside out and you create other, sided, uh, other forms that are even-sided um, uh, out of that puzzle. In a way, the inside becomes the exterior, the exterior starts to get folded to the inside. And that was exactly what I was trying to explore with the Neutra House. Whether you could take that, that simple geometry of the Neutra House and start to dissect it in a way where the transparency of the perimeter became transparency on the inside, in which all spaces were connected on the inside, and the quite literal opacity of the center uh, migrated to the exterior and created a stronger opacity around the exterior to quite literally invert or create an alter ego to, uh, to that modernist form. This is the, the roof of the house, this is the plan of the house. You, as I mentioned, you come in and you start to spiral around the house in a clockwise fashion. Uh, the house starts to unfold almost cinematically. There's a, there is a living room, sort of dining room, quasi-kitchen. All these spaces are a little bit ambiguous in terms of their actual function. Uh, TV, library space, uh, bedroom, which is really the only space internally besides the, the center courtyard, and then a quite large bathroom uh, and, and changing area, and then also you're out uh, of the house. But you're also able to move across those courtyards um, uh, so that you can short circuit, uh, uh, short -circuit the plan. Um, this is an image where you start to see both inside uh, as well as exterior, and the way that the same way the modernists um, uh, villa uh, blurred that relationship between inside and outside. Quite literally, here it's blurring inside and inside and inside and inside again. Uh, there are moments in the house uh, where the geometries come through, and, and and you occupy not just two spaces at, at any given moment but multiple spaces. This is one of, uh, I think, for me, the most important moments in the house where quite literally the space starts to uh, 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 open up like a perspectival hinge connected at one point to a number of different uh, inter internal spaces all at the same time, um, where you're occupying uh, not just three spaces in the foreground, but also the courtyard, the living room, and the valley beyond uh, across those spaces. Um, and as, as much as those interior, as much as the space is connected uh, visually on the inside, there, uh, and, and in a sense seems more, uh, uh, less hierarchical on the inside or less pointed on the inside, there are some moments throughout the house 
where the exterior uh, quite literally registers itself. And one of those moments is in this uh, skylight that's above the shower that relates to and, and directly uh, is a line, almost like a cylinder um, of space, uh, shooting through the house, cutting through the house, connecting that stone pine, that iconic moment on the hillside to the inside. It happens two other times in the house. So there are these points where the house does, in fact, register uh, to um, not the broad landscape, but very particular moments in the landscape. Um, one of the very first projects uh, that, actually the very first project that I started working on, uh, was a project in downtown Los Angeles called uh, uh, Inner City Arts. This is a school that was started uh, uh, in the um, late 80s, early 90s. It was in, in response to uh, changes that had happened uh, constitutionally in the state um, around uh, tax reform codes. And the reason that's important, it's a little bit arcane, but, but the reason for that was, uh, that made that important was that um, because the, the, the taxes in, in the state were capped, uh, it meant that as the state continued to grow, there was less and less money uh, for, uh, and as, for instance, the schools got more and more crowded, uh, there was less and less money for programs in the schools. And many things got cut. Anything that was considered extracurricular, like art, um, uh, was immediately uh, cut from the schools. And it meant that in a lot of wealthier uh, neighborhoods, parents were able to uh, get together and they were able to supplement uh, those programs for the schools. But in areas where that wasn't a possibility, where the uh, economics didn't uh, provide for that, uh, many of the schools started to slip further and further behind uh, other uh, 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 areas or neighborhoods of means. This is an area called Skid Row, quite literally Skid Row. It's mostly a manufacturing area, um, uh, processing area for things like fish processing, meat and produce processing. Uh, but it's also an area where the majority of the homeless population uh, lives, hence the name Skid Row. It's in absolute close proximity to downtown Los Angeles. And I like this image. It's an Elon Bond image um, from a helicopter uh, because it tells you quite a bit about the project um, and the uh, difference of the project from its surrounding context. But actually, I think it tells you much more about the city and the geography of the city um, and the, the, the role of, of architecture as it relates to uh, change in such a phenomenally large uh, context like a city like Los Angeles uh, that uh, the idea of architecture um, singularly as an agent um, or potential agent of change um, is, is, is quite a, uh, a questionable undertaking given the disparity uh, of, of just scale. This is a project that has been built iteratively over time. The first phase was completed in 1995 just as I was starting the office, uh, and we just uh, finished the third phase a couple of years ago, and now there's even some discussion about a, a potential fourth phase. Um, one of the things that uh, I've been so interested in this project is to see, in fact, whether architecture could even exist in this context. It's, a, it's an unlikely context, most people would, uh, I think, believe, for architecture, uh, one in which um, those traditional terms of context, and we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier um, uh, uh, in an interview um, uh, uh, for Fresh Meat, that, um, that the idea of context, I think, is a highly problematic idea in a city like Los Angeles, the term context. What does that mean when, in fact, this is what very much this part of the city looks like? How does architecture begin to relate to that? Does it relate to that? Um, should it relate to that? Um, and, and what tools does it employ in that, that type of place? I mentioned it's a, it's a three-phase uh, project. This was the, the, the first phase. Uh, the second phase was here on the corner, and then eventually the third phase uh, was uh, uh, the final build-out on this corner of 7th Street and two adjacent streets. What's important to this, for this image uh, for me was that, in a way, I started this project thinking about the architecture as a typical increment. That, that it was a building, um, and that anything we were proposing, anything certainly about the city, was really being proposed at the scale of the city. But increasingly, as the project has, uh, has changed scale, um, it's, it's really not so much uh, an object anymore, which is often the way we think about architecture. 
infrastructure and affordable building, but, but really starting to become fabric in a city that is not known for fabric. And the, the way in which ideas um, have had to transform in this project uh, uh, from and, and, and continue to evolve their consistency from the architectural, the singular architectural element to a larger idea of, of fabric, uh, I think is, is a compelling um, investigation, uh, something I've been interested in um, over the course of, of this project and has really changed the way that I even think about starting projects in the city now. Um, in the first phase, the project was much more highly isolated. Um, it had to be, there were real security concerns. Um, in downtown as they were building their project. Not only were the contractors having all of their equipment stolen, the guard dogs that they were putting in to uh, keep the tools safe were getting stolen. And, um, <laughs> and, and so there was this intense sense that anything, it had to be a fortress. And I was highly critical of that in the first phase. I thought it was something that we had, uh, uh, that, that we needed to try to change. As the project started to uh, change its scale and become more at the scale of the city, I felt like we had a different responsibility to start to open up the project. It still had many internal spaces, not so much for security in this case, but really programmatically, 99 seat black box theater that had to be an enclosed space uh, placed at the corner so that there was a stronger uh, uh, identifying or iconic element on that corner. Uh, that that form starts to feel like it's almost spinning um, uh, as it moves around the corner as a way of starting to quite formally create a pivot and to give you the indication that the corner does in fact move into the center uh, of, of, of the campus. And that internal space and trying to crack open the wall around the campus to give both visual as well as physical uh, connections to the inside life um, was, was very much what was at stake um, in this, in, in the, in the further developments um, of the project. And it was at that point that the project started to move from uh, a more traditional architectural idea of, of the building as form uh, to the composition being about space. And that's something else that consistently through the rest of the projects um, uh, I think has continued to uh, develop. My belief that really what we're up uh, up to is not so much uh, form, even though the form is very often animated and identifiable, uh, but much more the way in which those forms begin to characterize or create relationships across space. Because it's in, in space um, that uh, architecture's ability uh, to evoke uh, or point to uh, change, I think, really exists in politics and in, in, uh, in social relationships, uh, and certainly in terms of experience. Um, this is one of the interior spaces. Very often, the majority of the spaces are quite raw, uh, very simple um, uh, studio-like spaces. The 99 seat Black Box Theater is uh, increasingly becoming a real center for, this, for the community that does, in fact, live around Skid Row. Uh, there, there, there's some slight um, iterations of, of that form where for instance, there are places where uh, uh, there are skylights so that at times the space can be uh, infused with light. There are quite large doors, which you can't see here, but behind you, it opened the, uh, the, this space to the larger garden uh, as, as a whole. Um, inner City Arts has become, um, has I think moved from an institution that is about itself uh, to a very, uh, very much in parallel or in concert uh, to the architecture to something that's taken on other responsibilities in terms of its role to this part of, of the city. Um, Inner City Arts led to a series of projects which are ongoing, uh, the first of which is the Rainbow Apartments, which is a series of housing projects uh, for a group called the Skid Row Housing Trust. <clears throat> Rainbow was, uh, the trust had built a number of projects over the years, uh, and those projects uh, tended to be um, very typical type of project, uh, homeless shelter, basically an SRO, a single room occupancy hotel, where people would check in for a couple of nights at best and then be back out on, on the street. And uh, the trust was trying to change that model as, as were a number of uh, service providers like the trust. 
and, uh, where uh, they were looking at not only trying to build a more permanent community um, within these buildings, where people, these would become permanent housing, people would live uh, in these buildings, or could live in these buildings for long periods of time. This became quite a bit your home. Um, but also that the supportive services that uh, the tenants used to have to go out, uh, back out onto the street um, to find, uh, would be brought into the building. That was starting to create these buildings uh, in a very different way than they were used to. They were starting to create them as much more complex uh, organisms. Again, starting to replicate, not in, in, in extraordinarily broad ways, but starting to re replicate a more complex set of urban mechanisms uh, that, you would, that, that many of us would take for granted. Because of that, they had a new. They, they felt like they had a new relationship, or needed to find a new relationship uh, to architecture from what they were doing. Um, and uh, much of our work in the beginning was just having conversations about how that new type of complexity could take place. The first project, Rainbow, um, was uh, 89 units. Uh, the real invention here, I think, in many ways, was to uh, change the model from a double-loaded corridor. Uh, which you typically see, very much a hotel type of, of, uh, of typology where you come up the elevator, you come down your, the corridor into your room and you never say it again. And the thing we were trying to fight against was to uh, find ways of creating a semi-social space, not a fully uh, social space, because many, many of the tenants uh, weren't up for that. Uh, they had been on the street for so long that they had created this kind of shell around themselves, a, a level of isolation, um, uh, that going back out the, onto the street was too much. So the, one of the building's roles, it wasn't going to be able to change the whole equation, but one of the building's roles, I felt like spatially, was that it could start to create a semi-public space to allow the, the, the tenants to re-navigate what it meant to be public. And so we created a building that was a single loaded corridor. It seems like a very simple thing. You can do that in Los Angeles because the weather's outside um, uh, uh, without, without freezing. Uh, and the advantage, though, was that every time you came in or out of your apartment, every time you came uh, back to the street, every time you went to the community kitchen, uh, in a sense, you were in this common space. Um, now, I, I want to I talk about uh, these projects, I'm going to show two more projects, but they're, they're all, Bob, Bob mentioned this, that uh, over time, uh, as we started to do more and more of these projects, um, I've become um, uh, uh, more um, concerned with the way that very often people characterize this work, in our, not just our practice, but I think in architecture in general, uh, where very often people uh, talk about this Part of our work is being socially conscious work. Um, as if, uh, as I said, the, the other work that we do is somehow socially unconscionable. Um, and for us, and I think in architecture in general, one of the experiments that I'm interested in, that, that idea of elasticity, is to see if architecture has the ability to cover all of these different program types. And this is something that I think is uh, not a new invention, but very much following on the um, the uh, idea of, of a new type of responsibility that architecture could take on that the modernists uh, started certainly at the, the turn of the, the 19th to 20th century and even, even a bit before that, where, um, where the, the, the different typologies uh, of architecture started to broaden to take on many different types of projects uh, like housing. And in our studio, we think about them. In the office, we think about them uh, in all in the same same way. There's no distinction between uh, a single-family house for a wealthy person, a, a museum project, a landscape project, or the housing projects. And this is to reinforce it. This is a, a, a satellite image of our office. Um, it shows uh, the, the office at, uh, the office as a whole. They just point out that in the entire office. That, that the housing projects here um, and the uh, project here uh, is another one uh, here and here are, are thoroughly dispersed throughout that office. Uh, there is not a special department uh, for these types of projects. And I think increasingly um, that is, is uh, in, in a culture 
uh, and a broad culture of specialization. Um, one of the questions that um, uh, is uh, that exists for architects, and I think for certainly architects who are about to get out of architecture school and move into the prof profession or discipline, is how do you move uh, away from this increasing culture and expectation of specialization um, to uh, a more profound uh, uh, sense of, of, of a general practice, one in which um, uh, you can almost imagine uh, the, the work to be about uh, trying to develop a speculative practice, one that asks many different questions across many different types, and to not allow the practice to continue to be pigeonholed into more and more uh, specialization. Um, the second of those projects that we were involved in uh, is Carver Apartments, which was finished a couple of years ago um, as well. Uh, and this was a project where the Housing Trust was trying to move the um, uh, was trying to move the model outside of Skid Row uh, to a new part of downtown to not balkanize the, the homeless problem in one area. And this this project is interesting because it's not only uh, close proximity to the Staples Center in LA Live, which is where the Lakers and um, the Kings and the Clippers uh, all play, and the Convention Center, one of the significant downtown um, uh, destinations, uh, but also right on the edge in, in extraordinary proximity to the 10 Freeway, which is one of the most heavily traveled freeways in Los Angeles, it connects all the way to um, well, Florida and uh, Santa Monica on, on, on the other side. That sense of proximity to the highway uh, was, was important. Um, this goal of moving uh, the projects away from Skid Row was not just about uh, trying to change the balkanization of those projects uh, uh, in Skid Row, but it was really one of visibility. It was one of, of, of trying to make, seeing if, if, if these projects could in fact um, uh, become a more integral part of the visible uh, context of, of the city as a whole. And why I think that's so important urbanistically is that in many emerging cities, Los Angeles uh, and contemporary cities, Los Angeles certainly being one of those, but I think this is uh, increasingly a problem in, in all emerging cities that you see, um, that, that very often uh, we have, these cities continue to grow up as a series of silos, a series of, of cultural and social silos, a series of, of individual monocultures where different groups within the city are, are quite uh, isolated from each other, even though they, they exist in real proximity to each other. Uh, people describe Los Angeles as a multicultural city, but in fact it's really a lie. It is a city of many cultures, but it's not really a, a multicultural city. It's a city of, city of, 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 of separate individual cultures. And I think that that's another important um, spatial problem for, uh, for urbanists, uh, certainly for architects, landscape architects, but to, if you're thinking about, uh, about the urban context, how to begin to break those separations down. Another part of it is that you can, um, I think, also make the argument that infrastructures in a city like Los Angeles, the highway, um, are also, as some of the largest uh, and defining uh, structures in the city, are also monocultures. Very often they only do one thing. You're just on the highway. But when you think about structures at scale, especially for cities that are building new um, infrastructures, they have to do more than one thing. Locating the building here was interesting because at least we couldn't literally attach to the highway, although I, 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 I was I fantasized about that, but it, what, there was no way it was going to happen. Um, but maybe you could start to create relationships between the two that would start to point to uh, ways in which uh, something like the highway could be made more complex over time. The, uh, the, the other problem with this project is that the, uh, the acoustics of the, of the proximity to the highway uh, were something that had to be dealt with from, from an architectural standpoint. Um, I won't do this too many times to you, but the form of the building uh, is very much a, a, a round shape or a spiral. Uh, and that, uh, for a number of reasons. One, because as you move by on the highway, it quite literally feels like it is spinning uh, with you. And so there is uh, uh, an uh, ambition to make the building feel as if it's going to dance with the, the movement of the people on the highway. The highway is one of 
social and visible spaces in, in Los Angeles. Um, the other thing that that round shape did uh, was to create um, an, acoustic, an acoustically viable building form. Um, the, it means that the smallest amount of surface area is in proximity to the, to, to the noise generation at any given time. And, and that, had, that had huge benefits to, to the building as a whole. But the ground floor has a very different form, has more to do with uh, probably the plan form of the first house I showed you. Um, than anything else where uh, the concrete of the highway becomes the concrete of the plan of that ground floor, that the space underneath the highway starts to create or be connected to a series of perspectival, uh, 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 perspectival lines, spatial lines through, uh, through the building, um, as if the space is quite literally organized um, in relationship to those surrounding uh, uh, unfolding perspectives of, of the site. The form um, up above then, then changes uh, to this unfolding spiral shape. Um, each of the units is expressed on the exterior, all surrounding this quite tight internal courtyard, which is much tighter than the first project, Rainbow Apartments, I showed you, because of the size or scale of the site. Um, uh, it becomes the social heart of, of, uh, of the, the building. Um, it is quite tight. And these uh, long linear fins uh, that characterize the ins inside of that space um, have a uh, number of the more pragmatic parts of the project. They're, they have structure in them, they have roof uh, drains and methane vents, so that they couldn't be value engineered out of the building. But they do another thing, which is to start to create a, a little bit of a blinder in your peripheral vision. So as tight as the courtyard is, when you look to the apartments very close to you, they seem to be um, a little bit more hidden, even though you can see all the way across the, uh, the courtyard. The social spaces in the building spiral up through the building. They, they end up in an outdoor community space, community kitchen, uh, meeting area on the ground floor, the stairs and the courtyard itself, and then laundry room and TV meeting room on the third floor. And that space has become a very important part of this attempt to create a connection between um, these different communities in that it's right at the same level, the third level, which is at the level of the raised freeway, uh, so that it becomes a front porch for the people inside the building. And also, as we drive by on the highway, you can see the inhabitant, inhabitants on the inside. It's a small piece, but the idea that these two communities, for the first two, might Time, uh, for the first time might be able to actually see each other um, is at least an indication of how the form of the building can begin to change to uh, uh, point to these, these other spatial dynamics. This is looking up through to uh, the, the corner to the sky. Um, these projects are all small. Um, and this is the one I was just talking about. This is uh, Rainbow Apartments. I'm going to talk about this one in a second. These are some other projects that we're doing. Uh, most people think that cities change now, I think, by doing these large, enormous, uh, scaled projects that, that tip the gravitational balance almost of, of the entire city. But potentially, over time, iteratively, you could begin to imagine that a network of relationships, uh, as you worked on these projects um, incrementally, also has the ability if they're considered in the same light as one large project, could also begin to have a, a similarly large scale uh, change in the city. This project that we're working on just it's, it starts in construction in two weeks. Is a part of that thinking. This is a, a project called Star Apartments. It's 110 um, units. It's the largest of, of all three of these projects. Uh, again, a little bit right on the edge of, of Skid Row. Um, we're changing this building. Um, this is uh, a building that exists on the site. And here the model is changing again. What, what the Housing Trust is trying to do is, is changing the project again. For a long time, they've tried to, to, uh, to increase the amount of complexity in the buildings, not just the social services, the supportive services, and the housing, and the uh, private uh, the components for the tenants, but also um, to try to do a mixed use. But you've never been able to, you're not allowed if you're in the housing business to do this type of nonprofit housing business.
it's a doomed excuse. The housing department says you're not in the commercial business. You can't do that. But there's a loophole which says if you uh, have a building or you buy a building that has a commercial use in it, you can keep it. So the housing trust went out and tried to find a full block site that had a commercial use on the ground floor, uh, which means we have to keep the building um, and build something on top of it, which is a radical idea in Los Angeles to imagine that you're going to save a one-story building, especially one that looks like this. The typical MO is to scrape the sites uh, clean and to start again. But that also tells you something about the changing dynamic of these cities as they relate to things like density. It's not as possible to do that any, uh, anymore. The new project that we're doing, we're building, is keeping that building, keeping all of the structure of it, the frame. It has parking on top, so it has this very uh, useful concrete, very supple uh, uh, concrete deck on the top floor. And then um, we're building the new building on top of it. Uh, building a concrete tray to lift the apartments up above, uh, and then needling down uh, to connect to the existing structure in, in the new building, as if we're, we're perching on top of that that existing that that, that uh, existing 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 structure. Uh, and what that does is, contrary to the other buildings, it started to create a social space as courtyard on the, on the center. We're doing something that, in, in some ways, I think is is more consistent with um, the, the spatial idea of Los Angeles, which is to create this new space horizontally, trapped between the housing up above um, and the existing, existing building down below. So if, if, the, if the typical way of making uh, social space traditionally is to create a courtyard uh, with the walls around it, in fact, here we're tipping it on top of its, uh, itself so that the roof and the floor starts to become the thing that defines, defines that space. The other thing that's very, um, uh, uh, that's different about this project is that because we have to keep the commercial spaces open pretty much all of the time, otherwise they lose that loophole, um, we have to build it very quickly. So uh, the only way to do that is to, is, is to build the units very quickly and here we're uh, doing all of uh, the housing units as prefabricated units. This will be the first multifamily prefabricated build, uh, uh, multifamily uh, prefabricated unit building in um, Los Angeles. You haven't been able to do it up until up until this time. So from start to finish, the building uh, after we start construction uh, will go from what is typical of these buildings about 18 months to two years in construction. Uh, to right now scheduled to be a little under eight months of, of construction. Um, and I think it'll be even a little bit faster than that. This space um, is, is large enough now and broad enough uh, that it allows us to create a number of new activities all choreographed into this um, concentrated um, uh, uh, idea of, of, of a new um, activity precinct. Uh, so that you have things like jogging, walking track around, basketball court, uh, art and computer studios, uh, community, community kitchen, social support spaces, laundry room, meeting areas, uh, exterior uh, community gardens, yoga plaza. Uh, it's really this amalgam of, of these different uses in that, in that space. Um, and that, that, that idea of, of thinking about these kinds of spaces in, in, um, in a building like that, but also in a city like this, very often those types of, um, the, the, the conversation of what uh, is public and social space is not, uh, increasingly it's not been so much an architectural question, it's been a landscape question. And I've become increasingly interested and motivated to do landscape in our work. And this is a, a, our first full, we've been involved in a number of landscape projects in relationship with landscape architects, where we've been on teams with uh, landscape architects. This is the first project that we've done as the landscape architect, although all my landscape friends uh, cringe every time they hear me say that. Um, but I think this is one of the places where uh, disciplines have changed quite significantly. Um, I'd make the argument that, that in many ways, after uh, modernism, that urban design, as we knew it, disappeared. Um, and into that void, landscape started to insert itself into um, a stronger and stronger role. Partially because it had the ability to choreograph large space. 
um, and, and understand the mechanisms that work like infrastructure in large spaces or, or, or the mechanisms that are so much uh, uh, at, um, uh, or the mechanisms that are, that are a part of, of those projects. Um, this is a project in Playa Vista in the area of Los Angeles that is, is, is changing and developing. This is the Pacific Ocean out here, Santa Monica. This is a whole area. This used to be the Howard Hughes aircraft site uh, where he built, developed, and, and, um, and flew planes. It was a large manufacturing area, highly contaminated soils because of that. Um, there's a new development which is being built in this area. That's a, 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 a kind of new urbanist development. The idea is it's a very dense um, uh, development, low, uh, meant to be uh, low vehicle, low traffic uh, area. It's, start, it's still being built. Um, and the idea is that you're going to work and live and play in one, one area, which is, is a radical idea in Los Angeles. This far end of the site has been designated as the office park. And um, there are a number of developers who are involved who are slowly, because of the economy, um, building out uh, these, uh, this, these are Gensler buildings, these new, uh, mostly media um, uh, build, buildings for, for new media companies. It is very much a sub typical suburban uh, model of the office park. It looks a little bit like Abu Dhabi here, but this will all start to fill in around around this park. So the park is forecasting the coming development of this part of the city. I thought about this park not so much um, as a park to look at uh, in, in, in more traditional terms of what, what a landscape park uh, would be, but actually more a collapsing of uh, the two traditional models spatially of the park, the English picturesque experiential garden, the, the uh, garden of the body, and the French formal abstracted uh, landscape, the, the landscape of the mind, um, and try to connect those, those two formal ideas in a park that then fundamentally was about activity, uh, was, a, was a, a kind of hypercharging of, of different uh, activity possibilities, a bento box of, of different um, uh, experience and, and uh, 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 involvement activity. So uh, in this first phase, there's another phase which will happen here, which is, is mostly a meeting bridge and is uh, heavily Wi-Fi um, enabled. Uh, there is uh, the Lawn Sports Bridge, uh, 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 which includes um, artificial turf and, and soccer. Um, courts Bridge, basketball, beach volleyball, children's playground a large amphitheater uh, bridge for the community as a whole, small sports and shady sports bridges, horticultural gardens, which are these burn gardens where you can take horticultural classes, uh, and then information um, uh, bridge where uh, there's information components to these, these seating areas, seating furniture, and the landscape. And then in between are these water elements uh, uh, that many of these bridges span across. And that's a part of Another component of the project as a whole, which is to take the groundwater contamination, pump it up into the bridge, and bring them through these, or uh, uh, to the first bridge, and then bring them across the park as a whole through these uh, different landscape bridges and water uh, uh, ponds. Uh, and they act as, as biofilters for the, the uh, contaminants, and then at the end they can be pumped back into the aquifer. So the building acts a little bit like a lung. Um, or some cleansing work for, for this part of, of uh, the city. It's just some images of the landscape starting to grow. These projects were taken right after it was built, so it's much more grown up uh, now. I have to say it was a very different level. I thought uh, architects were patient, but landscape architects uh, are absolutely the most patient of all because it's driving me nuts how long it's taking for this thing to grow. Up. The, um, the, the, the most identifying iconic moment is the band shell for uh, the amphitheater, which is a fabric structure, a tent structure, um, on a structure which we worked with um, Eric, uh, uh, structural engineers, to create a, a kind of three-dimensional uh, spiraling, torquing uh, space frame, one in which um, there is a, a concentric ring at the top 
the bottom, but everything in between is really, really being held and supported uh, by uh, creating a, a thickened uh, a, th a thickened wall of, of structure. The thing about that that I, I was interested in is that um, in that thickening, as the structure, the bones of the structure get pulled apart to create more structural capacity, and the, the fabric structure being stretched across it starts to create the undulations of, of the sculpture of, of the, uh, the amphitheater form, the, the bandshell form, and you really begin to get the sense of the skin and, 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 uh, and bones on, on the inside because of that stretching at night. It lights up their uh, LED lights that can be tuned in terms of different colors. And here you get a sense of the support where the amphitheater feels like it's being perched over the, uh, the stage. It's connected just at the, uh, uh, the stage and, and at the very base uh, of, of the bottom. And then looking at it, I, I also like this image where the single family houses up above the hill seem like even when there's not an audience, that, that there, there is an audience there. Um, I'm going to finish with two projects. Um, one that's currently in development, um, San Francisco State University. Um, this is a, a very large project. It's going to be a phased project in San Francisco for the university to bring together all of the performing components of their creative arts uh, school. And it's um, a project that uh, is, is located, this is the university, these are housing projects. This is Lake Merced uh, Park. This is Lake Merced Boulevard. So San Francisco is in that direction. And this triangular um, uh, shaped site was uh, um, was uh, developed for this project and the master plan for the university as a whole to make the creative arts really be the gateway or the threshold into, into the school. Um, the, the project uh, is, as I mentioned, three phases. Uh, the first phase is a 1,200-seat theater. The second phase is 450-seat theater. And then the, the last phase um, has two additional theaters, a 300-seat uh, hall, 150-seat music hall, um, as well as many, many classrooms throughout the entire project. It's an intensely complex uh, building. It, it, over uh, 300,000 uh, total square feet. In a way, I was thinking about this project as not so much a landscape uh, project because of its scale or a, a, a building project per se, uh, but because of its scale, something that had to really perform at the scale of the city, where the mechanisms of thinking about designing this project were the kinds of urban design mechanisms that you would employ in the city. So it's not so much a landscape or architecture, but but one that, that um, I think of almost as a social, a kind of social ecology, uh, one where you're choreographing uh, um, uh, the experience uh, and the motivations within, within the building um, as a way of starting to get at ultimately uh, the overall space and, uh, and form of, of the project. Um, there were a number of ways to go about this project. In the master plan, it actually uh, called for a building that was uh, organized vertically because they were trying to open, leave as much open site as possible. And that makes sense. But the problem with that kind of a building, which you start to stack vertically, is that you isolate uh, these different components from each other. Um, and it, it has the effect, I, I felt, um, the same effect as I was talking about problematically in the city with some of the housing projects where you begin to create these silos of di different disciplines. But the goal of the university is to create a much more interdisciplinary, overlapped um, uh, set of, of, of programs and disciplines, um, a lot of cross-pollination between the different creative disciplines in the building. So instead of uh, vertically, we organized the building emphatically in a horizontal way, and then created this singular floor, uh, which, which acts almost as if it's the a campus quadrangle, or, or the way in which a campus works, where, where the campus itself is the thing that unites all of these different buildings, different um, uh, activities and, and disciplines across, across the campus as a whole. And then, um, the, especially the theater building, or the theater components, uh, are uh, acting uh, very much as, as important nodal and, and orienting points, uh, town squares and that, that larger uh, that larger construct. This is an image uh, rendering of the first phase. 
uh, which is a 1200 seat theater. This is that, that continuous datum floor, uh, which rises up and then continues in that direction to the other phases, but uh, uh, starts to march down uh, and become uh, a part of uh, the corner landscape uh, with the 1200 seat theater beyond. That, that entire form, while many of the uh, performance spaces and programmatic spaces have to be closed because of what they are, the theater has to be, for the most part, closed to keep light and sound out. Um, this, this, uh, this broader floor plate allows for great transparency into the activities and very much into the social movements uh, in the building as a whole. It's the plan. These are models which, which I think start to give you a sense of the intensity, the complexity. And where I was thinking about the composing of this project when I talked about urbanism, where you start to talk about things like, like grain, um, uh, almost as if it's fat or grain of the city, um, where the, 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 the passageways really start to act or take on the qualities of a series of, 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 of streets and boulevards and where the intersections um, uh, become important and, and socially charged uh, moments. Uh, the landscape does seep into the building. It's such a large, flat plate uh, to bring light and air and to begin to ventilate the building. The building, for the most part, with the exception of the performance spaces, is, is all naturally ventilated. Um, those interior landscape spaces become a big part of that, that scene. This is the 450 seat theater. Um, uh, this is the, um, the music hall, which is a very different configuration. Uh, where acoustically you don't need the corners in the hall. You only need the major surfaces uh, acoustically. And so the, the, the building form feels as if it peels out all of its corners, which allow for, uh, especially during uh, rehearsals, uh, as students are moving back and forth across the building to uh, appear and disappear into that building as if you were moving into or through a, a square in a building. And then the 1200 seat hall, the, the opera hall, um, which is configured in, in the same way that a traditional opera is uh, in the horseshoe shape because I, it has the benefit of creating as much intimacy, it puts as many of the audience members in close proximity to the stage as possible. But the problem with that, that, that form is that it's, um, the opera tends to not be a, a highly democratic form um, because the balconies as they move up uh, are really segregated into um, uh, different social strata. Here I'm trying to create the sense that those balconies are quite literally interwoven um, uh, between all of the different groups and uh, uh, to have the same effect as the building as a whole, to communicate, to give you the sense that, that, uh, that, that different uh, uh, audience groups, different um, social organizations are, are literally tethered or woven together. Finally, I, I wanted to at these images because, as Bob mentioned, we just won a competition on Friday. Um, and I have never talked about this project in the lecture, so I don't have necessarily, uh, I'm not sure exactly how to talk about it um, uh, in, a, in a more condensed way. But this is a project for St. Petersburg in Florida, um, uh, which was a project to design primarily a new pier um, uh, at the edge of the waterfront of, of St. Petersburg. The project, the pier project, um, uh, the, the existing pier starts here and ends up in the water out here. It's a straight line. But the project was really, the, the potential for the project, we thought, was to begin to use this project as a way of imagining a, a series of, of connections uh, and linkages to use this project as a way to leverage the design to take on idea about the future of the entire waterfront, and certainly the relationship of the city to, um, to the water as a whole. The problem, we thought, of, the, of traditional piers is that they're really one direction. Um, most times, you start here, you walk out onto the pier, and you come to a moment out at the end, uh, which is, in the case of St. Petersburg, an existing pier building out there, upside down pyramid uh, shaped building now that contains uh, arcade-like uh, events. But experientially, it's a, it's a very singular thing. When you get out there and then you're done, there's always that moment where you have to turn around and go back, um, which uh, uh, seemed experientially like, um, at the very least, an antiquated. 
anti-climatic uh, anti moment. Instead, I started to think about the project as a series of interwoven loops <coughs> where it, the experience um, of, of movement, the experience of the uh, connections to the surrounding landscape and city, the connections to the pier and the pier itself were a series of, of constantly evolving, unfolding circuits that, that never really um, uh, uh, doubled back uh, in the same way on, on it itself. Uh, but in a sense gave you um, the possibility of, of, um, of experiencing uh, the land, the city, different views, uh, but the water itself in, in constantly evolving and changing ways. Uh, that experience uh, also allowing the water to be very much at the center, so that as opposed to the line, the pier became uh, a space. Um, uh, with the water being the thing that you really occupy. This gives you a broader sense of, of a number of those loops. Working with Tom Weider, landscape architect, on this project, Bureau Happold is uh, the engineers, uh, to connect over to the Noy Basin, uh, across to um, uh, what's called Demon's Landing. Um, there are a series of these uh, energy islands which have been de uh, developed, which I'm not going to get into, but all the way down. Uh, major boulevard of the city to something called Mirror Lake, which we were also including in the overall planning of, of the project. This is just a diagram to give you a sense of those, those loopings. Um, there are a series of moments. The pier itself has almost no program. And that was something intentional. It seems to me that in our culture, um, we're terrified of public space that doesn't have something that says, do this um, there. Uh, the idea that just uh, being in a place and having an experience uh, as the thing in and of itself is something that, as a culture, that I think increasingly we've lost. We have a place, there were a number of programmatic elements that were important, and those we've mostly distributed around uh, the actual the landscape, including a quite large amphitheater, which makes sense because it's in closer proximity to the city, but allowing that space to be, for the most part, about uh, uh, your connection to uh, what is more fundamental about St. Petersburg, uh, the water, uh, the qualities, and the characteristics of the light um, and, uh, and the horizon. Here you see moving out to that space, which starts to become formed by uh, the new design of the pier. Um, uh, as you go out, it's quite wide and low to the ground, which allows emergency vehicular access and things to take place. And then as you come up through that loop, uh, uh, starts to wrap up and around the, the pier form, uh, the bowl form, and then back out onto um, a much higher uh, 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 walkway to give you views up above the water. This is the inside of that space where boats can come into uh, what is now almost a lagoon or harbor. The bay is very choppy. You can't dock boats at the existing pier. And so the form of this new shape has a series of, of dams or dampeners along the whole base of it, so it quiets the water on the inside, which allows you, uh, will allow you to kayak, paddle boat, um, bring uh, small, even small sailing boats into uh, this, this new harbor. You can see there are a series of, of ways of moving up, including bicycle and walking paths that, that seem to circumnavigate up through uh, this form. At night, it can be projected on, it becomes quite intense. Uh, town square for the city. Um, these are this is the, one of the plans where that, that harbor you can come through as this walkway rises up over, you can come into that, that harbor. These are uh, a series of causeways which emerge as the tide uh, uh, changes. If, when the tide goes down, uh, these walkways start to emerge. And this is where the existing pier is. We're saving the existing pylons, and Tom is developing. A, uh, a new landscape below the grave, below water, um, that is a shellfish habitat and, and seagrass habitat, uh, which is a way of starting to think about the landscape, not just on the ground, but the landscape being, uh, the water being landscape as well. Um, shellfish have this huge effect on being able to clarify the water on the inside of, of this pool. You can see one of the walkways. Uh, coming up through the structural analysis. 
Um, but uh, the exterior of the bowl is a very different uh, quality. On the inside, it's meant to be a very intimate um, space, one in which uh, it, it does, in fact, become uh, one of the rooms or the room for the city to gather, to see each other, um, uh, to experience together. On the, uh, on the outside, as you come through, there are these quite large apertures which form a series of discrete views. But, but more than anything, uh, give you this sense of moving from one um, uh, environment, one atmosphere, to a completely different scale of space uh, as the bay uh, continues out and, and moves out to, uh, to the ocean. Now, you can occupy these, these concrete blocks and um, they become a part of that, that social space on, on the outside. But you can begin to also move up through your elevators and walkways and you can get up uh, to these balconies so that while the inside of that bowl shape is really a communal experience, there's the possibility of having quite individual experiences. To just be there by yourself, um, away from uh, and, and distinct from, uh, from the responsibility of being a part of the whole. There is one programmatic element which is in that box, which is a small gelato shop. Um, and then finally, um, the, last, uh, the last image of that, where um, uh, you get a sense of, of what I think is not only going to be an individual experience, um, but uh, a connection to um, uh, a form that um, uh, is trying to do many things. It is trying to, on one side uh, and on the inside, be that uh, space at a, a new kind of civic scale. Uh, on the exterior, uh, to certainly provide for the ability for, for individual experience, but uh, uh, just as, as importantly, to be at the scale of this much larger horizon and the bay um, as, as a whole. Um, I appreciate being invited. Thank you very much. Track level uh, 
has a deep influence on, on the building. Um, and I think the reason I've, I, I, I talk about things like characteristics as opposed to context uh, comes because of, of coming from a place like, like Los Angeles, where the idea of context doesn't really, has associations that don't really necessarily hold in a place like Los Angeles. But there are values and qualities in those environments that I'm very interested in relating to. And that very often has to do with things like the particular qualities of, of, of the light and the coloration of the light, for instance. The white started to turn into something that uh, uh, I started to work very hard in making uh, the neutrality, the seeming neutrality of the material have the ability to pick up those characteristics of the place. So that the shade, the shadow, the coloration of the light um, are the things that very often animate um, those surfaces. And I work very hard at, uh, at the abstractness and the subtlety of those contexts. So for instance, the, fir the first house I showed, the Pippin Mountain. It's hard to see in those images, but um, the, the skin, which is a plastic skin, um, has this intensely uh, deep spatial uh, level of texture to it. It's, it's, it's like cottage cheese almost. It's so, um, it's so porous and, and deep. And then the cuts into the building, whether it's the cuts of the entry of those, those, those window cuts, are a high, smooth, super smooth um, uh, texture. So you get these real textural differences that I think are material qualities to, to, uh, to the building. But more importantly, the way that that form, the skin, reacts to uh, that place over the course of the day, uh, the, uh, the way, a different way that it reacts to the course of, of, um, of the year, is for me a, a more compelling way of, of dealing with this, the material aspects of the building. And this is something I noticed that was really hammered home uh, a number of years ago, we did a project for uh, the Museum of Modern Art in, in, in New York, uh, 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 Mama Queens. And it was a temporary building, and it was meant to be there for a few years while the Taniguchi building was being built. It was an existing building there, the Swingline Stapler Building, and it was a blue glazed brick building that had been there from, it's where they used to make the, the staples for Swingline Stapler um, Company. And the building had been there for a long time, and I wanted to keep the blue because everybody knew it as a blue building, but we had to reclad the building for conservation. Uh, it was too leaky. There was going to be art in it. It had to be clad and sealed off. We were using this basically uh, like a stucco plaster product on the exterior. And I wanted to make it a blue building. So we chose a blue color um, in Los Angeles. And they were going to do the test. We, had, we chose actually three shades of this blue. Um, and we sent those colors off in the color chips, and they were painting them in New York on these big, they were 10 by 20 foot sections of the building to test them out. And I flew to New York, and I was really excited because it was going to be a great color. And I, I, I drove right to the, from the airport to the building, and I got out of the car, and there were the three colors, and they all sucked. They were horrible. And they were all the wrong color. And I, it, I re realized immediately that the problem was that we had chosen those colors in one type of light. But in that other light, in, that, in the New York light, they were something completely different. And so I, it was at that moment that I started to realize that, that um, yes, context um, is important. And materials, we were taught that materials were one way of relating to those places. But the characteristics of the place at a deeper, more fundamental level, and the way in which the material qualities um, uh, related to that. Uh, meant for me that there was a different avenue to explore. It was a long way to turn out. Uh, uh, this question is about 
backstory, but it, it grew a lot out of, um, I love the plan. Um, I, I went to school at a time when the plan was a, a very important aspect of the way that we thought about more about architecture. Um, but I also felt, especially when it came to cities, that the plan uh, uh, was uh, being used in a way that um, was, was just furthering uh, the, the disjunction, the separation, the experiential separation between um, the person in the city and the planning of the city as a whole, uh, where the, the plan was being used at kind of God's eye view, abstracted, to uh, create um, the organization of the city. But what I was interested in was the way in which um, the individual in the, 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 the city started to have a stronger um, uh, relationship to the experience of the space of the city as opposed to the form of the city. And that movement, and, and for me a real interest in a number of, um, uh, especially sculptors working in that line, that vein, through the 60s and the 70s, they were important presidents. When I started doing work, I think I was, um, my, I think the, the projects were much more intensely choreographed. The movement was much more intensely and consciously choreographed that, um, that I really thought of the way that you were going to move and the way that the, the in, a, in a highly narrative way. And, and I thought about the sequence of, of spaces and forms and their relationships um, in a sequential way that I really, under, I believed I understood the way that I was controlling and communicating what I was after through those, those, um, those narratives. But over time, I became uh, very concerned about it. I became also very suspicious of that. Especially as I think public space uh, continues to become increasingly controlled. Um, I started to think that what I was doing was, was playing into that. Um, too heavily a role, and so I started to look at ways of, of still making movement the generative idea, um, especially as it related to space. Um, but I was trying to imagine whether there was a more open framework that could be developed um, without losing uh, your ability to control and order a plan the way that you needed to. And I think the, the projects have been a real evolution in that idea, so that when, in the Pittman House, for me, one of the real developments in that project is that, yes, there is, when you call it a composite sense of movement, I think that that's a really accurate way to describe it, that, that there is this sense of, of that, that, that pathway that starts actually well before you even get close to the house. Um, that the house is, is, is the tail end of this, uh, this journey that, that is taking you up there as you spiral in, in a clockwise fashion. But much more important is your ability on your own to move across those different lines and to experience um, two spaces quite literally in their, their simultaneous relationship uh, to each other as a, real, as a real goal. And I think the work is um, continuing, right? well, that's a real part of the way the work is continuing to evolve. To, um, I, I don't feel like I've exhausted that investigation. Generosity of experience 
relentlessness, the relentlessness of, uh, of the contemporary landscape, the contemporary horizontal <coughs> landscape. Um, and I know that sounds maybe, I don't think that's exactly answering your question, but I'm fascinated by the idea that um, the part and the whole are completely distinct, um, or could be completely distinct. That hierarchies are produced um, not through differentiation, but um, through subtle distinctions. Um, and uh, uh, that um, uh, part and whole um, continuously, have the ability to continuously unfold in your experience. I, I'm in, I'm, I want somebody to be subsumed in the evenness of space and yet not have a monochromatic experience. Oh, it's a really good question. I know one's asked me that question exactly in that way. It's as much a sensibility as it is um, that I'm after as it is a um, Specific formal agenda that I can do. In a way, that it's also a response to a false question about the white satisfies the suturing of the whole. Is it is a graphic way to suture the realization together? I think that's I think that's I think that's right. I mean, part of the, the material question is to. I'm not against material. <laughs> uh, okay. <here>. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think that it is about uh, certainly not using using monochromatic material in a way uh, to do exactly that. To not use material as a way of differentiating um, the parts. Um, do you feel like your earlier, I'm sorry, you got to speak up. Sorry. Do you feel like um, your earlier years at Gary Studio has influenced you as a designer today? I missed the last one. Do you feel like your earlier years working for Frank Gehry has influenced you as a designer today? Um, yes, I, I, absolutely. I don't think um, uh, uh, you know working with Frank was an incredible experience. It was a lively time in that that office, um, and I got to work on a number of, of, um, of very compelling projects. I think, uh, I think though, um, as an architect, you're always an amalgam of your experiences. Um, and uh, that are all of the offices that you end up working for. And for me, it was a number of offices uh, that I worked for, Frank's office being the most um, iconic of all, of all of those offices. Um, I, I will say that the thing, uh, so I, I think, as, as, a, as an architect, as a, both a young architect, an emerging architect, and then eventually an older architect, um, the thing that you're always looking at is, I think, um, both trying to understand how all of those experiences are useful to you, um, and to also try to connect to something um, that uh, was really fundamental in those those experiences, to strip away a lot of the baggage and the static that you're constantly trying to navigate uh, in the world, the way everybody's trying to navigate through the world and make sense of the world. Like, those, those experiences, I think, allow you to, um, they're like touchstones. They allow you to say, okay, that was about that, and that's what I felt at the time, and that's what I thought was important at the time. The one thing that was different about that office that I think has been more than anything influential in the way that I think about not architecture in terms of form and the buildings, um, but in terms of the way that I work, is that uh, that was, uh, one of the things that Frank produced was, um, I believe, uh, a culture of the possible. Uh, he made an office that, uh, I think it, if you look back at in terms of its invention, is as inventive, inventive and maybe even more important than any of, I'm not saying the buildings, but, but more important than any singular building. And the reason is that that ability to make a place where every time you walked in, you thought that 
anything was possible, uh, that uh, created an armature or a construct, a foundation in which you could imagine the extraordinary and not only believe but that it was possible, but, um, but uh, where you had the means to make those things possible. Um, I think was something that I, I very much understood. And I think in the way that even though my office operates you know, in certain ways differently, you know, if you look at it, everybody operates, it has their own personality. I think that is something that I constantly am aware of. That the thing that I'm trying to make, and probably I spent more time on than any individual building, is to constantly try to make uh, the culture of the place. To make a place where there's a sense that, uh, that the ambitious, uh, and at times, the preposterous is, is, is actually possible. You're right at home here. <laughs>